All right. Well, again, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to confess that my wife and I don't really have green thumbs. In China, my wife Anne kept what I like to call the plant graveyard. It was a shelf where she stored all of the old pots where plants used to live, but now they had sadly passed on. When we moved back to Canada, though, there was this plant and it just flourished under Anne's care. She had at first to repot it and then she divided it between a number of different pots. She just figured out the right amount of water and the right amount of sunshine for it to thrive. But when we moved to this house that we're in now, the plant didn't do very well, even though she continued to care for it in the same ways. The problem was we just didn't have that windowsill that got the right amount of sunlight to put the plant on. Plants need the right conditions to flourish. And if you don't provide them, they're just not gonna do that well. Well, that truth doesn't just apply to plants. It applies to Christian fellowship as well. If we want our church's fellowship to flourish, we need to give it the right environment to grow. Um, oh, there it is. <laughs> I lost this for a second. Let me get my PowerPoint moving. We need to give it the right amount to grow. And let me... Oh, boy. We've got to go all the way back to the beginning. There's a preview. Sorry about that. <laughs> when I did, we're in a sermon series right now called Devoted to Fellowship where we're exploring various aspects of fellowship. Last week, we saw how our fellowship with one another is dependent upon our fellowship with God. This week, we're going to examine the atmosphere we need in a church to promote fellowship. And the truth is there's a lot of different atmospheres or conditions that promote fellowship, but we're forced to focus in on one. I could easily preach a sermon this morning on that atmosphere being love, or grace, or forgiveness, and the list could go on and on, but instead we're going, to, we're going to narrow it down to humility, because I think that's one that isn't as obvious to us, and it's often overlooked as a result. You think about it like baking a cake. There's a lot of ingredients that are necessary for that cake to come out right, and if you miss one, it's just not going to be quite the same, is it? I mean, some ingredients are critical. If, if you think about like sugar in a cake, that would be love. It's what makes our fellowship sweet. But humility, that would be the flower. It's the base. It's the thing from which everything else is built on. Often people work on fellowship, but they're frustrated because they're missing this key ingredient. We have to create an atmosphere of humility for fellowship to thrive. Now, we're going to discover that's a problem in uh, the passage that uh, Cheryl already read for us this morning. The Philippians had some issues with their fellowship, but Paul calls them to humility to help work on that. So we're going to examine the vision that Paul lays out for fellowship, and then we're going to see that his teaching on humility divides nicely into three parts. We could see it as the motivation, the means, and the model. So we're going to cover all of that. And, and my prayer is that this is going to motivate us to cultivate humility in our church so we can reap better fellowship as a result. But before we begin, let's just briefly ask for God's help in prayer. Heavenly Father, we commend ourselves to you this morning as we look into a passage that is so, so challenging. Who among us is worthy to preach on humility? But Father, we're looking at your word, and we're looking at your teachings and your example. So lead and guide each one of us this morning so that we can truly understand how to practice hu humility as you desire us to. And Father, from understanding this, may we be called and strengthened to live out humility. God, do this for us this morning, we pray. We are entirely dependent upon the Spirit's guidance. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's start by looking out at that vision of fellowship. So we actually have to skip ahead to verse 2, because that's where Paul lays it out. And he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Paul describes the kind of unity 
that this world is hungry for. It's a fellowship of people who are united in both heart and mind. I think we all want to have the same love for one another, right? We want to live in a community where we're all equally loved. When we love someone else, we want them to love us back. And that's what fellowship is supposed to be like. It's beautiful. But if we're honest, it's also really elusive. We might have this kind of mutual love with a few people, but an entire church, well, that just won't happen naturally. When Paul talks about being of the same mind, I think we can get a little bit confused here and wonder if he's talking about something like brainwashing more than unity and fellowship. Is Paul wanting us to think in exactly the same way? No, that's not what's going on here. Paul isn't talking about how we think or what we think. He's talking about our attitudes and our goals, more what we want than what we think. Our wills, not our thought processes here. I think that later statement that he makes, being in full accord and of one mind, clarifies what he means by when he says being of the same mind. He's talking about a community that's in complete harmony in its purposes and goals, not a community of people that all think and talk alike. It's kind of like a sports team where everyone works together in different positions with different skill sets for the one goal of winning the game. Or I love to think of an orchestra where different instruments are playing different parts, but it's all the same symphony played in harmony. Fellowship is unique individuals with different backgrounds, personalities, and strengths all working together for the same goals, to worship and serve God and tell other people about him. But true unity of hearts and minds like this is extraordinarily difficult to achieve. In fact, it's not natural. It is a supernatural work of God among us. We're not going to stumble into healthy fellowship. We need God's help to pursue it and to enable us to achieve it. That's exactly why Paul starts by giving the Philippians motivation for fellowship. He does that because he knows fellowship is really hard, and there are going to be times that we want to give up, times where we feel like it's too hard. And so we need that encouragement to faithfully persevere in pursuing this fellowship despite the difficulties. Now, in all fairness, I don't think we need as much motivation these days as before because we all miss that fellowship of being together. We're hungry for it and craving it. We're looking forward to when we finally can regather. And I think for most of us, we're willing to work on that fellowship now so it'll be even better then when we come back together. So I'm not going to spend so much time for the sake of our time and, and because I don't think it's as necessary, I'm not going to spend as much time on the motivations Paul's going to point out. But let's go through them briefly. He starts out his list in verse 1 by saying, if. And that doesn't mean Paul isn't sure if this is the case or not. This is a rhetorical device that Paul use, uses. He's certain this is the case. And because it's the case, he's calling us to work toward fellowship. And first of all, we do have encouragement in Christ because he loved us enough to die for us. And because he loves us so greatly, we are motivated to love those other people that Christ loved enough to die for because he loves them. And when we feel like giving up, we remember he pursued us in love. And so he commands us to fellowship. And so out of thankfulness for our salvation, we want to pursue it too. We're encouraged in Christ. And next, we have comfort from love. Any parent will tell you that a crying child finds great comfort in the loving embrace of being held. And, and that's true for us too. We find comfort from God's love and from our love for one another. And so um, fellowship will only make that comfort sweeter. And so that motivates us to pursue it because of the comfort it gives. Now, participation in the spirit is a key phrase for us because participation comes from that Greek word koinonia that we looked at in the first sermon of this series. Koinonia is a word that means to share something to someone or to share in something together. And here it's referring to how we all 
share in or participate in the spirit together. We are connected to each other by the spirit objectively. That is just a fact. And because of that fact, we should seek to live it out subjectively in our daily experience to one another by prioritizing our pursuit of fellowship. And that's something that we covered in the last sermon I preached. So next, Paul calls them to pursue fellowship out of affection and sympathy for one another. In other words, if they care for each other and what they're going through, they're going to want to build and develop their fellowship together. Now, finally, his last appeal almost sounds selfish. Like, do it for me so my joy will be complete. But that's not what he means. He's pointing out that fellowship is supposed to be a, a major source of joy in this earthly life. It brings vibrancy. Fellowship isn't a dull duty for us to pursue. It is this one of the means from which God seeks to make our walk on life more enjoyable and more happy. And so it's building the kind of community we were made for. So who wouldn't want to work on fellowship, right? If we are to create an atmosphere of humility for fellowship to thrive, Paul's briefly given us some reasons why. As we've looked through this, I think that encourages us when we finally do regather to not be satisfied with simply what we had before, to not go back to the old normal, but to find a new normal, to go deeper, to make it richer, to go further into fellowship. And as Paul has finished telling us the motivation for fellowship, he's going to give us a means in which we can get deeper in our fellowship, in which it can become sweeter for us. And that means is humility. Let's look at how he explains this to us in verses three and four. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul sets out two negative examples that that are uh, full of pride and are fellowship killers. He talks about selfish ambition and conceit. Now, notice he says that we can do nothing from selfish ambition and conceit. There are no exceptions to this. There's no rationalizing instances where I really had to do it this time. Simply put, we are to never allow ourselves to live in these two areas. Paul then describes two forms of humility that are the opposites of these two forms of, of pride. And, and really, one can, can corresponds with the other. Selfish ambition has its answer in verse 4, and conceit has its answer at the end of verse 3. Paul prescribes two forms of humility that are the opposite and corresponding cures for these two types of fellowship sickness. First, let's start it with conceit, which could easily be translated as vain or empty conceit. The idea behind this is that you have this elevated opinion of yourself that's actually wrong. You think you're better than others because you think too much of yourself and too little of others. I think there are very few people, though, that are listening this morning who are thinking to themselves, yeah, I'm conceited. That's a problem that I have. I have to confess, when I was studying this, I felt the same way. I don't know if conceited is really something that describes me. But rather than trying to convince you by bringing out examples to convict your conscience, I think the simplest way to show us that we all struggle with conceit is to look at what Paul describes as the opposite. Um, if conceit is to have too high an opinion of yourself, the opposite, to be humble, is to count others more significant than yourselves. If that's the antidote of conceit, if that's what people who aren't conceited look like, then I have to confess, I struggle with conceit. Maybe you do too. It isn't, I, I think though, as we should take a moment to clarify what this verse is and isn't saying. It isn't saying that we have to consider others better than ourselves, as if we all have to walk around pretending like we're the worst person that we know. This doesn't mean a humble person 
can't think that they can do anything as well as other people or that they're the worst sinner out there. That's part of the world's misunderstanding of humility. They think it's for people who have low self-esteem, but they couldn't be further from the truth. Humility isn't convincing yourself of a lie, that you're the worst thing there is, or thinking that you're terrible. Instead, humility is about choosing to count others as more significant than you. Count here doesn't mean like you've done the math, you've added up your value and worth, you've added up their value and worth, and they come out higher than you. That's not the meaning of this. It means that you choose to uh, treat others or regard or consider others as more significant or more important than you are. How can you do that, though? Well, there are two undergird undergirding principles that make this radical choice possible. First of all, we recognize that every person is made in the image of God and as such is equally worthy of respect, honor, and care. So no matter how lowly or difficult or sinful that other person is, as an image bearer, they deserve to be treated with importance. But secondly, believers are free from all the insecurities of trying to um, be good enough or trying to show our importance, to puff up our own pride so we feel like we are worthy of other people's consideration. We don't need to have those insecurities because we know we can't be good enough. That doesn't depress us. That truth is actually incredibly liberating when we add to that that Christ was good enough for us. And when we put our faith in him, we are accepted because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. It isn't a question of us being good enough. We are made children of God by him, and nothing can change that. So it's not because of our insecurities, but because of our security in Christ. We don't feel threatened to choose to treat others as more important than ourselves because nothing can change who we are in Christ. In fact, I believe that when we do that, we show the world who we are in Christ when we treat others as important in this way. Now, I want us to consider what difference this humble attitude might make in our fellowship together. Imagine for a moment a famous Christian that you really respect. You fill in the blank. It could be somebody from the past, somebody from the pet present, someone who has really, you just think is an awesome Christian. You wish you could meet them sometime. Imagine they were to show up one morning at our church when we actually are gathered together. How would we treat them? Since we know that they are a significant person, we already respect them. Well, I, am, I, I think we might greet them with a little bit more respect than normal. We'd really be interested in talking with them because we're curious about their lives. They're, they're important to us. And we try to figure out ways to help them to be comfortable, to know their way around the church, to know when things start. Maybe we'd ask to sit with them and, and help them to um, understand how to go through our service. In the gym, maybe we'd ask them, well, what do you like with your coffee? And we'd get them it. Or, or I am sure that they'd have multiple invitations out for lunch after CE class is done. Do you get what I'm driving at here? We give them that extra bit of attention and respect and honor and care because we know that they're important. Now you might say, well, isn't that favoritism? <laughs> Not if we do that with everybody, right? That's what we're being called to here. If we truly counted others as more significant than ourselves, think about it, there'd be way less stepping on people's toes or, or uh, wounding people's pride because we wouldn't be worrying so much about what other people are doing and saying to us and how they're treating us. Instead, we'd be thinking, how am I treating them? And that little change from how did you just treat me to how am I treating you makes a world of difference when it comes to fellowship. See, when we get our eyes off of ourselves and onto the other person, we'll make that person feel special and loved and we'll actually care for them better, too, as a result. Now, that's the kind of community I want to be part of. That's the good soil that helps fellowship to thrive.
And we can do this, but it's going to take time, effort, a lot of practice, and make no mistake, it will require God's enabling and empowering help. But Paul didn't just mention conceit as a fellowship killer. He also mentioned selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is focusing on some personal goal, regardless of the cost to others. It's selfish because the person who lives this way cares only for themselves and their own good. If they have to tread over other people to get at what they want, they're willing to do it. Now, when I first read this, to be honest, when I saw conceit, I thought, oh, you know, I know I struggle with pride, so maybe conceit's a little strong, but maybe. But selfish ambition, I'm not really a super or overly ambitious person. You know, I'm not like that, that corporate guy in the rat race who's stabbing everybody in the back to get ahead. That's not me. And so does selfish ambition really describe me? Well, maybe you're thinking the same thing. And I bet you that corporate guy is thinking the same thing about himself too. Um, but again, rather than trying to convince you, I think it's just best to look at the opposite. The, if you're not suffering from selfish ambition, what would you be like? Well, it's described here by Paul in verse four. Here he says, let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also the interests of others. Selfish ambition pursues my own interests over those, over the interests of others around me. True humility considers how events benefit everyone and seeks the good of all, not just personal good. So I think here again, it's useful to make a few clarifying comments before we look into the fundamentals of this. This verse answers those who feel that if, if you consider others more important to yourself and you're, you're trying to live for their, their uh, interests, then you're just going to be walked all over all the time and people will take advantage of you. They're, they're misreading the verse. It does not say consider other person's interests and not your own. It says look not only to your own, but also to the interests of others being taken advantage of is not to your interest. And so you don't need to, in following this verse, be a constant doormat for people. That's not what this is talking about. But it's talking about mutual benefit, looking at the overall good. The other uh, misunderstanding we might fall into is if we think this verse is teaching that Christians can't be ambitious. It's not ambition that the pro that's the problem but when ambition is selfishly pursued. We can redeem ambition when we submit our goals to God and, and we pursue them in a way that brings him glory and blesses those around us. God wants us to be ambitious, just not in selfish ways or for selfish goals. We should strive for excellence and be the best that we can and there's nothing selfish about doing that. And, and so as we've hopefully cleared up some misunderstandings, let's now look at some of the principles that undergird this, that allow Christians to live out in this radical way. First of all, this is simply a logical outworking of what we just looked at. If you recognize that everyone else are image bearers, equally important, and you are choosing to treat them as more important out of your security and your place in Christ, then logically, you're not just going to be living for your own interests. You realize that my goals, my good, aren't more important than his goals or her good. And so we choose to look more in balance, to consider how does this affect <clears throat> my one brother or my other sister? It's just fair and reasonable to think about how our actions affect those around us and to seek to bless them. This form of humility also assumes fellowship in Christ. All believers <clears throat> are connected in Christ. We're family. We're brothers and sisters under the, our Heavenly Father. And when a family is healthy, they look out for one another and make choices to mutually benefit each other, right? Can you imagine if my family came into an inheritance and I thought to myself, ooh, that is just enough money for me to make a trip by myself to Hawaii. I'll see you guys after I'm back in two or three weeks. <laughs> when I get back, the, the doors are going to be, the locks are going to be changed on the doors, aren't they? 
where either we either all go together or we don't go at all. That's just how family works, right? Now, can you imagine if we truly treated everyone at church like this? If, if we didn't just treat everyone as more important, choosing to honor and respect them in that way and taking interest in serving them in that way, but we add to that, we want to live not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of those around us equally. That would revolutionize the attitudes in our church. We derive at meetings, not just looking for what we could get out of the meeting, but um, what we can give. You know, some meetings, maybe that we attend, we don't learn very much. Maybe we don't get the encouragement that we were looking for, but we see, hey, this brother or this sister, they were really encouraged by it. It really served their interests well, and that would satisfy us because it's not always about me, right? And also, we would come prepared. We wouldn't just show up. We'd come with sort of the meditations or the, the, the blessings that, that God had given us that week, and we'd want to share that with our brothers and sisters. We'd want to serve in order because we would be seeking to make this, uh, this meeting a blessing, not just to ourselves, but to the other people who are there. Also think about this fact ministries wouldn't be something that we try to cling to as our own little kingdom, our own little corner of the church that we rule over. Instead, we'd be seeking to raise others up to train and mentor them because we want them to get the same experience and the same blessings we've had by serving in these areas. And we'd want them to grow in that way. Also, I think people would feel safe to try out different ministries because even if it turns out that they're not gifted and they decide they're not going to be involved, people won't look badly upon them because we know, hey, that was a good thing for them to try out. We're looking out for their interests. And a lack of conceit when it would make confessing our sins to one another a lot easier, wouldn't it? When we know that wouldn't be received as, oh, you're awful kind of a thing. And instead, the person who is really looking out for my interests would be looking for ways to support me and help me to overcome the sins that I'm struggling with. Wouldn't that be great? If we really worked on our attitudes of humility and how we relate to one another, we would see a noticeable difference in the quality of our fellowship together. Create an atmosphere of humility and fellowship will thrive. But we need to be clear, these these changes, they can't happen overnight. It's going to take time, and we're going to make mistakes and fall back into old patterns. It's going to be hard, but it's worth it, isn't it? If we, if, 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 if we haven't been convinced yet, Paul is going to give us one more reason to pursue fellowship by pursuing humility in our lives together. One more um, one more uh, thing to motivate and drive us when we feel like giving up. See, Paul has shown us some motivations for humility. He showed us in this last section the means of humility. And after motivation and means, next he's going to show us the ultimate model of humility in verses 5 to 11. So I'm going to read. From Philippians 2, please look in your own Bibles, verses 5 to 11 now. <clears throat> Reading from the ESV version, it says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a beautiful, beautiful passage. I love that passage. And I, I really wish 
we had time to go into a, some of the theological depths and beauty of this passage, but really our focus in the sermon has been directed toward verses one to four. And we're looking at verses five through 11 more as a survey to see how they show us Christ modeling the kinds of humility that Paul is calling us to obey. So rather than going to the depths of theology here, we're just going to trace out Christ's humility. But first, I want us to see in verse 5, Paul is clear that we can have this humble mindset that he's been describing in Christ. In other words, this is part of our sanctification through the Spirit. Um, this, as we daily abide in Christ, repenting of our sins and allowing the Spirit to draw and lead us to faithfully living after him, we will grow in humility because the Spirit makes us look and act more like Jesus, and he is the ultimate model of humility. None have shown humility like him. And this, this passage that follows outlines two of the great humblings that Jesus undertook to become our Savior. The first runs from verse 6 to the first half of verse 8, and it outlines the humbling of the incarnation when God the Son became human. See, Jesus, it says, was in the form of God. He had equality with God, but he didn't grasp onto it. He wasn't unwilling to let his equal glory with the Father go, but he emptied himself of that glory when he took upon himself not just the form of God, but now the form of a servant as well. In other words, the almighty, eternal God, the Son, that existed in the constant praise of heavenly beings so magnificent, we can't even imagine them. That is the one who left all that glory to become human, and not just human, but as a lowly human, as far as society was concerned, a servant. Think about it, from almighty sovereign of the universe to a servant. We can't imagine how much humility that took Christ to come down and become one of us. I mean, man, we struggle. We struggle to see another person as important as us or to treat them as more important than us. That's hard for us. But this is the most important being in the world. As a member of the Godhead, he set aside so much of the glory that was his due in order to save us. He is the ultimate, ultimate example of living out, uh, not living out of a sense of conceit. And that's where the next humbling comes in. He came to save us in the crucifixion. We see that in the second half of verse 8. The, immor the immortal Son of God died, and not just any death, death on a cross. The cross was, of course, a humiliating death as they hung you up as a spectacle for everyone to look at and laugh at. But it was also a torturous death, which was slow and agonizing. But the truly astounding thing about the death and the cross that causes this uh, Paul to say even death and the cross was the fact that in dying on the cross, Jesus took the curse of our sins upon himself. He took the punishment that we deserved. We deserve to be sent to hell for eternity as sinners who have rebelled and forsaken God. But rather than us having to go to hell for eternity. He was willing to die upon the cross for our sake, to take the punishment we deserved. See, that is an amazing condescension. And if you repent of your sins, and you put your faith in the fact that Jesus died for you, that that's enough, you don't have any work to complete, you can't be good enough, Jesus did it for you, and if you just trust him and repent of your sins, you will be forgiven of those sins, and you too will become a child of God. And this, of course, is the ultimate example of, of living for the interests of others. I mean, we were sinners in rebellion of God, deserving hell, 
And Christ lowered himself to die on our behalf so that we could be saved. Christ is the ultimate example of humility, both in his incarnation and becoming human, and in his death in dying for our sins. What follows in verses 9 to 11 is the complete reversal of his humiliation to his exaltation. Because he was willing to go so low, God raises him to the highest place where every knee will bow to him and and pay homage to him. And every tongue will confess that name that is given to him, and it is the name of Lord. And he will reign and rule. There's a lot we could say about this beautiful conclusion. But again, we're trying to focus in and narrow our vision for sake of time on verses one to four. How does all of this apply to our call to live out of humility for the sake of fellowship? Well, Paul is using Christ as a further motivation for us to live in humility because there's a principle that God raises up those who humble themselves. You know, Peter echoes this very same lesson in 1 Peter 5 and 5 when he says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, we've never, we'll never be exalted like Christ, among other things, because we could never lower ourselves. No one came from a higher place than Christ came. No one has gone lower than Christ went. And so none deserve the exaltation he received, but Christ alone. He alone is worthy to be called Lord. And we we admit that. We see that as we worship him this morning. But there are blessings in following that humble path that Christ took, even if we do it in a much, much lesser way. And the blessings are obviously the same either. And we could talk about some of the blessings as closeness with Christ, as um, a better righteousness, more joy and peace through the spirit when we do this, but we're focusing on fellowship here. We could go on more, but I want to suggest that one of the blessings that God gives us, one of the ways he raises us up when we lower ourselves down is by giving us sweeter fellowship with one another. Because when we create an atmosphere of humility, God causes our fellowship to thrive. So this morning, we followed Paul as he's laid out for us a vision of what fellowship should look like. He's shown us the various motivations for why we should pursue this fellowship. He supplied us with the means of achieving deeper fellowship through practicing humility in the ways that he described for us. And then he's capped it all off with this beautiful demonstration of how Christ exemplifies. He's the model of true humility that we are to emulate, and thus we can, among other things, enjoy deeper fellowship with one another. So looking at all this, where do we go from here? Well, it's going to take us uh, all working together to create the atmosphere of humility that our church needs. If each of us waits for the other person to start, nothing is ever going to change or get better, right? So I'm calling on each one of us to step out in faith and choose true humility. I believe that progress is made in little steps. So I think it's really useful to give us uh, just a little bit of examples of what we can practically do to start heading down this path. We recognize that humility comes from the heart, and there's heart work that we have to do before God, but also we recognize that humility has to hit our feet. And so I want to suggest a couple changes or a couple things that you can do this week to practice this a little bit more. Um, I'm going to call you to pray to God to put one other believer on your heart, one person who this week you can treat as more important than yourself. Maybe you do that through calling them 
or sending them a message, finding some way to serve them or bless them. Get creative about it. Spend time thinking about it, but find some way, excuse me, to live out the, per, uh, the attitude that considers one person as more important than you. Just one person. You can handle one person in a week. But I want to add one other thing. It's not too much. I want you to pick one church meeting that could be small group, that could be CE class, that could be fellowship, that could be a prayer meeting, whatever it is, one meeting. And I want you to go into that meeting entirely seeking the interests of others, not just your own. If all of us try to do this, that this week, one person that we're going to treat as more important, one meeting where we're going to pursue the good of others in it, I really think we'll see a noticeable difference in our fellowship. And if we just do one person in one meeting in one week, I think we can string together the next week and the next week. And we start to, to develop those rhythms of humility. And, and I think it can make a big difference in our lives. And when we're tired or we feel like giving up, it just doesn't seem to be working or no one's doing this for us. That's the time that we look to the humble example of Christ to inspire us to persevere in pursuing humility for the sake of fellowship. And not just for the sake of fellowship, but because Christ showed us as the perfect human being that the path to life lies through humility. He saved us through his great condescension, and he calls us to follow in that path of humility. And when we do, we are living in the way God intended us to live. And we will find, as we follow him, that he is a companion, a very near companion to us in our journeys. May we live in true humility and create an atmosphere of humility for our fellowship to thrive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how extraordinary it is that sinners who have been saved only by the grace of God must be taught to battle against pride, to fight against conceit, to struggle against selfish ambition. But this is the case, and we do struggle with this. It is so dissonant with who we are outside of Christ, so dissonant with the great act of, hum of humility that we see Christ do for us on the cross. Father, help us to repent of it. Help us to do better and to live out the humility that Christ exemplified for us. God, may we have a church where we honor one another, where we respect one another, where we show great interest in each other, and we care for one another. May we have a church in which we place other people's interests on level with our own. God, do this in us, because our wicked, sinful hearts can't do this if you don't do it in us and for us. Father, we look to you in expectation because we want to be more like our Savior. And if we're humble this way, we do look more like him. God, we praise you this morning. We thank you for your goodness to us and pray for your blessing in the days and weeks to come as we seek to live out truly humble lives before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.